Hello and welcome to the Disability and Jesus Sunday service for today, the Feast of Pentecost, the birthday of the Church, as many people call it. So perhaps we should sing, Happy Birthday to us, Happy Birthday to us, Happy Birthday dear Church, Happy Birthday to us. That's enough singing from me, I'm not as good as Katie when it comes to that department. But it's very, very good to be with you and to have you along today, whether you're joining us at the beginning, the middle, the end of the day, sometime during the week. It doesn't matter because through the medium of these videos, we can worship alone yet together. Even though we're apart, we are one body with one Lord and one spirit who animates our lives together. So as we move through the service today, it's our prayer that the Holy Spirit would inspire and strengthen you in your faith and that you would draw close to God as he draws close to you. Let's pause to pray our prayer of confession and penitence, bringing before God the things we've thought and done and said, or perhaps not, where we've gone wrong. So words of introduction first, and then words in bold on the screen that I invite you to join with me in saying when we get to them. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. Let us then be open and honest and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Words of forgiveness and absolution. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy Spirit, sent by the Father, ignite in us your holy fire. Strengthen your children with the gift of faith. Revive your church with the breath of love and renew the face of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Bible reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there was staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of our God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? 
Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen very carefully to what I am to say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming and the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So often life is full of what you might call crucial moments, those crossroads times in life where we realise that we've come to a moment, we could go one way, we could go the other, maybe we have a decision to make, maybe there's an opportunity, maybe like Moses we find a burning bush or something that suggests to us that we should turn aside and consider something new. But whatever it is, one of the experiences of life, the features of life, is that we meet these moments where something happens that can't really be ignored. It might be something good, it might be something bad, it might be an important decision or, as I say, a response to something we encounter. But in some way, what happens in that moment will set direction for the future, uh, at least for the immediate future. And some of those critical and crucial moments have impacts that are felt across the world. Medical breakthroughs, for example, the development of vaccines against COVID-19 and their rollout is one of those kinds of moments. Suddenly something shifts and the, the world opens up before us with new possibilities, different possibilities. Sometimes it's political events. I'm old enough to remember the coming down of the Berlin Wall, just not old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, those times when life seems to hinge and new possibilities emerge. There's the Good Friday Agreement, which has been under so much tension with Brexit, and of course there's Brexit itself. There's things like 9-11, and even this week, there are happenings like the conflict in the Holy Land. Where will that lead? And thankfully, a ceasefire seems to have been agreed, and maybe that in itself can be a crucial moment. But the thing about crucial moments is that they're never the end of the story. The crossroads isn't the destination. We might come to those crucial moments and dwell with them for a while, if something good happens, we might spend some time rejoicing and enjoying that before we move on into the future. But at the end of the day, we have to respond to the crucial moment. Respond and travel forward. Take the opportunities, press on with what needs to be done, seek the good, seek the right path forward. What's certain is that more crucial moments will come. There'll be further obstacles, there'll be further breakthroughs. It's a bit like a baby taking their first steps. You have to persevere, you have to keep trying, you have to keep going. But as I say, these crucial moments are just part of life. The most crucial moment that there's ever been is, of course, the cross and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, crucial means cross-shaped, cross-like. That's why we often think of a crucial moment as a crossroads moment. There are various ways we could go. But in that crucial moment of the cross and the resurrection, God in Jesus defeated sin and even death. 
and moved us into a situation where, as St Paul said in the letter to the Romans, nothing now can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what the crossroads is that we come to, and it doesn't even matter ultimately which of the roads we take. Nothing in all creation can ever separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. But like any crucial moment, it's not the end of the story. The resurrection isn't the last word in the New Testament. We know that. What the resurrection is, is a new dawn, a new beginning, the beginning of new creation. And when we are in Christ, as St Paul also says, there is new creation. New creation bubbles up within us. It's not that we are a new creation, it's that we are new creation. We live it, we embody it, and we embody it because of another crucial moment. Easter tells us what God has done for us and what possibilities God has opened up to us. But Pentecost tells us something about how God equips us to respond to Easter and to the Ascension. God equips us to respond through the gift of the Parakletos, the Paraclete, the Advocate, the Comforter, the Mediator, the Intercessor, the Helper, the Guide, the Companion, the One who is called alongside us. That's what Paraclete means. The Holy Spirit is called to accompany us and wonderfully accompanies us and guides us and comforts us and all those other things from within because by the Holy Spirit God comes to dwell within us, new creation in our very being. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live this new life that dawns at Easter, that bursts from the empty tomb that's revealed in the wounded yet resurrected Jesus. It, the Holy Spirit brings the work that Jesus began in his disciples to fruition in his church as we abide in him, as we're grafted into the vine that is Jesus. So the Holy Spirit flows through us like the sap of a tree and we burst into fruitfulness. We blossom with the kingdom. The Holy Spirit brings us new life, new energy, new insight into what Jesus was teaching and living and calling us to. The Holy Spirit, though, is a big problem. The Holy Spirit's a big problem because he or she, depending on how you like to refer to the Holy Spirit, he or she is not nice and neat and tidy. The Holy Spirit is constantly on the move and therefore so must we be. The wonderful image that the Iona community have for the Holy Spirit, of course, is the wild goose. The wild goose that chases you down the path and drives you forward. And that's one way of thinking about the Holy Spirit's constant movement, constant pressing forward towards the kingdom, constant flowing through us to bring more and more fruitfulness, more and more blossoming. But the other thing about the Holy Spirit, as well as the constant movement and energy and life, is that the Holy Spirit is not binary. It's not about this or that, black or white, in or out, etc., etc. That would be much, much easier if faith was a set of binaries and we could simply say right or wrong to anything. That would be much, much easier. But we don't have and we don't really want a codified lexicon of truth in the sense of a book of rules, a book of answers to everything. We don't have, and it wouldn't be good for us to have, a set of clear answers to every question. That would leave us like automatons, like robots, simply programmed to do the right thing with no free will, with no free choice. 
The lack of that means that the way is open for a living and growing and dynamic relationship with God and the Holy Spirit enables and empowers that. But to live that fresh, dynamic, new every day, leading us forward all the time sort of relationship with God, we must encounter him through the Holy Spirit every day, afresh every day. We can't simply rest on our laurels. We can't simply say about faith that it's business as usual, that what worked yesterday or last week or last year or 10 years ago will work exactly the way it did then if we apply it today because we live a new set of circumstances. We live as different people today from what we were yesterday. No matter how little or how much has changed, we change. Time moves on. And so as we encounter the Holy Spirit fresh every day, we are reminded of the fact that we don't possess the truth any more than we possess God. We don't know the answers. We don't simply apply what we knew yesterday and make it work. Because it's not that we possess the truth or that we possess God. It's that the truth possesses us. That God possesses you and me through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We must always be open to that. We must always be listening and learning and growing in discipleship and understanding. And that's not about what we do or what we're capable of or what our abilities or disabilities are. It's about our relationship with God, which is alive and active and growing and living. So the Holy Spirit reminds us that we've never got it taped. We've never got the answers. We've never got God into a box and never should we have God in a box. As the f famous saying goes, you cannot possibly fit God into the box of your mind any more than you could fit the ocean into a bucket. The living, growing, fresh every day, ongoing journey of life with God by the Holy Spirit is what makes discipleship discipleship. It's what makes us pilgrims on a journey of discovery with God, moving hopefully always closer to a fullness of life in him and a wholeness in him, but always journeying, always traveling. And so our prayer today on this Feast of Pentecost is for the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a prayer that would be filled with the Holy Spirit and that we would long for and be open to the fruitfulness and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's a prayer today for guidance and for inspiration, a prayer above all for desire for the kingdom and for God and a prayer that God would use us, that God would use us as channels of his blessing so that as the lifeblood of the Spirit flows into and through us, so the blessings that it brings would flow through and from us for the church, for each other and for the community. And that's my prayer today. My prayer is that we would be channels of blessing for each other because we are so open to the love and the light and the life of God by his Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, let's shine with God's light. Let's show God's love and let's share God's life together as we pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. Our intercessions today are adapted from a wee worship book, Morning Liturgy A, from the Wild Goose Worship Iona community. At the end of each short section of prayer, 
when you hear me say, your kingdom come, I invite you to reply with me, your will be done. Words lifted from the Lord's Prayer and a real sense of, as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday, the beginning of something new. What we're asking for is that God's kingdom is here in a tangible way. That all that God wants is everything that we want to. So let us pray for the breaking in of God's kingdom in our world today. Jesus, you taught us to trust you in all things. We hold to your word and share your plea. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where nations budget for war, whilst you say, put up your sword, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where powerful governments claim their policies are heaven blessed, while scripture states that you bless the powerless, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where those who speak up for dignity are treated with scorn or contempt, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where our prayers falter, our faith weakens, our hope fades, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where we are broken in body, mind and spirit, and wholeness seems far from us, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, you have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our lives to receive you. Strengthen our hands to serve you. Give courage to our hearts to love you and our neighbour and ourselves. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Hello friends and greetings from Liverpool. God's love surrounds you and God's presence fills you wherever you are, as you are, God is with you. So may God who knows you and who loves you without any limit. May that God bless you. May the strength and the fullness of the Holy Spirit inspire and fill you. May you come to know Jesus more and more fully and to stand with him in righteousness and holiness and in the struggle for justice. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you, each one, and remain with you always. Amen.